Well, good morning, everyone. If you could turn in your Bibles, please, to our kind of key text that we've been using, 1 Timothy 4, verse 7, just to remind ourselves of the uh, kind of uh, theme that we've been developing over the course of the weekend. 1 Timothy 4, verse 7, it begins this way. It says, but refuse profane and old wives' fables. And then uh, kind of the key idea, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. And we said that this word exercise that's mentioned here, it's the, the Greek word is gymnasia, from which we get our English word gymnasium. And it simply has the idea that we need to be disciplined. We, you know, if you want to get the perfect body, you got to go to the gym. And you've got to go to the gym often, and you have to have discipline. And if you want to be godly, then you have to have discipline. If you just never drift into a life of godliness. And so the importance of discipline, and we talked about the disciplines of prayer, and both individual prayer and then commitment to corporate prayer. Uh, that's a discipline. It's a discipline that's needed in our lives, where uh, we can be very ill-disciplined in the area of prayer. Uh, we talked about the discipline of the Word of God, reading the Word of God, memorizing the Word of God, listening to the Word of God, making ourselves a people who are saturated in the Word of God, uh, that we with thoroughly biblical in our thinking and in every way. And then we talked about the, the discipline of assembly life, that where uh, God's will for us is that we be in fellowship in a local assembly, that we be faithfully in fellowship in a local assembly, that we were committed to the work and building up that work and glorifying Christ, using our gifts in the context of the local church. And now for our final uh, area that we want to talk about the discipline of, and that's the discipline of being a witness for the Lord Jesus. And I want you to turn with me, please, to 1 Peter chapter 3, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. 1 Peter 3, verse 15. I'm going to read three scriptures uh, on this theme, and then we're going to kind of develop it. But just for the sake of reading, verse 15 of chapter 3 of 1 Peter, he says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Some translations read, Set Jesus as Lord in your hearts. And then it says this, And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So the idea is that I should be always ready. I should be, it used to be a very famous battery called Ever Ready. Do you remember Ever Ready batteries? Or maybe you're, you're in the Duracell generation, but, but Ever Ready was a big name in batteries. And the idea is that we should be Ever Ready to tell people the reason for the hope that's within us. That we should be constantly ready. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. We'll come back and look at these verses in more detail, but just for reading 2 Timothy 4 verse 5, it says this, But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Paul speaking to Timothy, and if you remember anything about Timothy, Timothy was timid. He was a guy that needed lots of encouragement. He wasn't a bold kind of individual. And Paul said to him, Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. Now, he might say, well, Paul, that's not my gift. He said, it doesn't matter whether that's your gift. Do the work of an evangelist. I might have not have the gift of giving. So every time the play passes every Sunday, I said, I don't have the gift of giving. Is that legitimate? No, I'm still responsible to give. And I'm still responsible to give out the gospel. Right? I'm responsible. Whether, whether I'm gifted or not is irrelevant. Do the work of an evangelist. And you notice he says, endure afflictions. One of the reasons we don't like to do the work of an evangelist is we don't want to endure afflictions. We don't like it when people slam doors in our faces. We don't like it when people reject us. We don't like it when people say no, and we, we feel that keenly, right? We just So, so we don't want to endure afflictions, and so we don't do the work of an evangelist. And he says to Timothy, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist. You've got to they go together. Uh, there's going to be rejection. i just tell you a true story. I have a friend. He's a, 
He preaches in the, on the streets of Edmonton, Alberta. And this man is out in all weathers. Now you think of Edmonton in the wintertime. He has a snowsuit. He goes out in his snowsuit and preaches every day on the streets of Edmonton. And people, he's, somebody tried to stab him. Actually, that person that tried to stab him ended up in prison. And guess what happened to her in prison? It was a lady. She got saved. She came back to him because <laughs> he's always on the same streets. And she went up to him and gave him a big hug and said, I tried to kill you one time, but now you're my brother. She got saved. Amazing. And so, so this guy, he, he's out in, and there's a lot of affliction. He gets a lot of heckles, the LGBTQ, whatever letters are going. They, they show up when he's preaching to hassle him, to try and, you know, I mean, you talk about affliction. This guy goes through a lot of affliction. But he just, last Wednesday, I got a text from him. Two people that called on the name of the Lord and been saved on the streets of Edmonton last Wednesday. He's seeing, he's seeing blessing. Yeah, there's, there's afflictions, but there's blessing. And, and so just want to encourage us, you know, endure affliction. Be willing to put up with rejection, but it's not you they're rejecting. It's the Savior they're rejecting. It's not you they hate. It's the Lord Jesus that they hate. And so just be reminded of that. But uh, again, one more verse, and then we're going to dive into this topic of the discipline of being a witness for Christ. Luke's Gospel, chapter 6. I'm going to try and make it practical, as practical as possible, on how to be a witness for the Lord Jesus. Luke 6 and verse 45. Luke 6, verse 45. We read this. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaketh. I just want you to get that last phrase. Out of the abundance of his heart, of the heart, his mouth speaks. And the, the thought is simply this, that if your heart is full of love for Christ, it'll be a lot easier to speak about him. It's not hard to talk about someone you love. I can tell you a lot about my wife. It's not difficult for me to talk about Anne-Marie because she's, a, she's had such an impact in my life. I thank God for it. It's very easy for me to do it, right? Because I love her. It's not hard. Even my grandkids, not difficult for me to talk about. I've already mentioned them during the course of it, right? It's, it's not difficult. Somebody you love, you speak about them. How much do you love the Lord Jesus that you're willing to speak about him? Remember we said that this is, this is a devotional life. It's, uh, we're devoted. We're in love to a, a real person. Do we share about this person? So where come, where's the discipline coming in? The discipline is disciplining our minds with a gospel mindset uh, to, to, you know, you just, again, you're never going to drift into doing the work of an evangelist because life is busy. You get up, you eat your Wheaties, you do your stuff and you never think about it. You've got, you got to have a disciplined mind. Why am I here? Why am I not in heaven right now? Why has the Lord left us here? It, it's not for worship because we're going to do worship in heaven. We're going to do lots of worship in heaven. You're not like me here for that primary purpose. Now I am to worship while I'm here. The, the only thing that I, I, that I can't do in heaven that I can do here is witness. Mm -hmm. Because everybody in heaven is already saved. So I can't tell somebody in heaven how to get saved because they're already only there because they're saved. But here, I have the privilege of witnessing for the Lord Jesus' sake. And so we want to be, have our minds with this gospel readiness. Look at uh, Romans chapter 1, please. Why don't you see something about the Apostle Paul? Romans chapter 1, just a lovely chapter. And he, he just spells it out, out here. Uh, his mind. What kind of a mind did this great apostle to the Gentiles have? He says in verse 14, I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. He felt like he owed a debt to the human race because, because he had been given a message of how people can be saved. And he felt an obligation. I, 
I've got this message. I, I have an obligation to tell people this message, right? He felt a debt. He says, I I'm a debtor to all these different people groups, the Greeks, to the barbarians, the wise, the unwise. And so then he says, verse 15, so much as in me is. So the idea is this, we, we, we can paraphrase it this way, with every fiber of my being, as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. He's a debtor. He's ready. He's not ashamed. Now, we talked about the analogies Paul uses. He talks about the athlete. He talks about the soldier. And one thing about a soldier is that a soldier should be in a constant state of readiness. Because war could break out at any moment. Chinese could fly spy balloons over Montana, and the next minute you're at war, potentially, right? In other words, this is high-risk business, and as a soldier, you should be always ready. Well, you're a soldier. Of if you're saved this morning, you're a soldier of Jesus Christ, and so you should be on a constant state of readiness, readiness to take the fight to the enemy to make an assault on his evil empire, and the Lord commanded it. Uh, we, we call it the Great Commission. I want you just to see, and he repeats it over and over again. Uh, in the four Gospels, he mentions it. He mentions it in Acts. We're just going to look at a couple of them, Acts 1. Uh, and again, we thinking of ourselves as soldiers. Well, if we're soldiers, the Lord Jesus is the commanding officer. And we don't have any right to disobey the orders of our commanding officer. And this is what he says in Acts 1 verse 8. He says, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon me, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria to the uttermost part of the earth. And so uh, these apostles, they, they had previously, if we remember the story well, they'd all forsaken him they denied him you know we, we think of peter uh, he denied the lord three times with oaths and cursings and, and they were cowards basically frightened of the mob frightened of the repercussions that could have happened all of them were like that and it's not just peter it says they all forsook him and fled and yet he says don't worry about that that's then but i'm going to do something it's going to change a game change is coming you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And then you shall be my witnesses. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, but the most parts. And it's amazing, Peter, who uh, was, was intimidated by a little servant girl, a maid. You're one of his disciples. I don't know him. <laughs> the same Peter, after Pentecost, stares down at the mob that had crucified Christ at the previous festivals. And he stares at them and says, you crucified your own Messiah. What changed him? Well, the Spirit of God changed him, right? Gave him a holy boldness that Peter didn't know anything about before. And, and that same Holy Spirit is available to give you boldness to speak for the Lord Jesus. Even if you might be timid. I remember uh, when I was a new Christian, um, our assembly had a, an open-air ministry, and we would go into the streets of Leeds and uh, in a shopping precinct on Saturday mornings, and we would preach in the open air. And I remember, never forget the first time that it was my turn. And I tell you, my knees were knocking, my stomach was churning, I was praying for rain. I mean, it was like like nobody was more kind of against this idea. In fact, I remember in my unsaved days seeing a guy preaching the open, the open air, thinking, this guy's nuts. And here I am, it's my turn. And I tell you, when I began to speak, my teeth were chattering. But amazingly, a boldness came from the Spirit of God. And I, I got, began to love open air preaching. And we did it every week for two years, every Saturday. And, and I became one of the main guys doing it. And it's amazing. I like it totally uh, against my nature. But the point is that we can do this. 
They'd been previously locked in an upper room with the doors bolted. And now in the power of the spirit, all their fears were overcome. And these men were given a boldness to speak for Christ. And the same spirit is available to give you a boldness to speak for the Lord Jesus. And so we, we see it in Acts 1 8, we see it in Matthew 28. All authority in heaven and earth is given to me. Go ye therefore, right? I mean, he's the he's the ultimate commander in chief. And he says, Go, and you better have a good reason to say, No, I'm not going. And as you go, you make disciples of all the nations. Now, we, we talk a lot about Acts 2. We talked about it yesterday, about those that gladly received his word were baptized and, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and all these things. But what's interesting is that actually it didn't start with Acts chapter 2. You see, how did those gladly receive his word that were baptized? you got to back up. It began in a prayer meeting, Acts chapter 1 where for 10 days they were in that prayer meeting, 120 of them. Then the Spirit of God came on the day of Pentecost, gave them holy boldness, and the first thing they did when they came out of that upper room is they had an open-air gospel meeting. And 3,000 people were saved, and those that gladly received his word, they're the ones that were baptized and continue steadfastly. And so we've got to say that somehow we've got to back it up a bit. Yeah, we want to do this, these New Testament things. But if what we need more than anything else is new life, new converts, new people. And it's amazing when you get new life, new believers in an assembly. The, the amazing thing about it is that, um, you, you know, you'll show them a truth that you've known for years and they get so excited. I mean, they'll say, wow, is that really true? And you say, yeah, it is. And then suddenly, guess what happens? You think, wow, it really is something, isn't it? See, we've almost got used to this stuff. And we need new blood to help us to realize how marvelous what we have really is. But our, our biggest fears are pride-based. Really, the heart of why we're not doing the work of an evangelist is pride. What will people think of me? Will they think I'm a fanatic or an extremist? Am I willing to be known as a fool for Christ's sake? And really, it comes down to pride. I'm concerned about, it doesn't, in a sense, it doesn't matter what they think of you. What matters is what do they think of Christ? That's the real issue. And why this is so critical is. Those people that we come across that do not know the Savior, they are in a terrible, terrible state. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4 with me just for a moment. 2 Corinthians 4. I want you just to see this in verses 3 and 4. It says this, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Now, why just to get this? If our gospel is hid, if, if they don't see it, and they're not going to figure it out themselves because the, the devil's blinded their minds, you see, they're, they're completely duped. They are completely deceived. And, and how are they ever going to hear? Well, Paul puts it this way. How will they hear without a preacher? And the answer is simply this. They won't. They'll just simply die and go to hell. That's what's going to happen. And so it, 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 this is, there's so much at stake here. And you know what's interesting is I believe that there's more evangelistic zeal in hell than there is amongst God's people sometimes. Look at Luke's Gospel, chapter 16. Luke 16, this is a very well-known true story the Lord Jesus tells about a rich man who was rich physically, but spiritually he was bankrupt. He was a lost soul. And when he died, he woke up in Hades, in a place of, of torment. And I want you to notice, we'll break in Luke 16, verse 27. This is um, this man, 
the rich man speaking. And this is what he said. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, speaking to Abraham, he says that thou wouldest send him. This is uh, the beggar that went, was carried by a delegation of angels to Abraham's bosom, a place of comfort and blessing. He says, I, I pray thee that thou would send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that he may testify to them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. Let me just say this. What, what this rich man is saying is this. I've got five brothers. And I don't want them to come where I am. Isn't that amazing? There are people in hell and they wish somebody would go and tell their relatives. I've had people say, oh, well, you know, if my husband is, you know, deceased husband is in hell, I want to go where he wants, where he is. But this passage tells me that if you have a deceased husband who wasn't saved and he's in that place, he doesn't want you to come to him. He, he wants somebody to come to you and tell you how you can be saved. So, so here's this passion in hell of people saying, we don't want anybody. To, we're not, this is not a party here. We don't want anybody else to come. This is a place of continuous conscious torment that goes on forever throughout all eternity. We do not want company. Please, somebody, go and tell my relatives. Maybe God will use you to go to their relatives and tell them about the Savior. So the tragedy is that somehow in our culture, being religious and even nice is become synonymous with being saved. But there'll be a lot of nice religious people with the rich man in hell. What they need is a Savior. What they need is the gospel. Look at Matthew's gospel, chapter 9. Somehow, the Lord has to do something in our hearts to give us a bit more compassion for the lost. And we talked about becoming like the Lord Jesus. And God's plan for us is to become like the Lord Jesus. And, and we see something of the heartbeat of the Savior here in this verse. It says in verse 36, but when he saw the multitude, speaking of the Lord Jesus, says he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then said he to the disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, the laborers are few. Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into the harvest. But I want you to get what we see here. The Lord Jesus saw the multitudes. Folks, do you see the multitudes? And if you see the multitudes, what do you think of them? Are they, are they in your way like the traffic here in, in South Florida is terrible and all these people are holding me back from getting to my appointment? Or do we see them, the multitudes, the way the Savior sees them? They're sheep. They don't have a shepherd. They're, they're lost souls. And do we have any compassion at all? And what, what I'm saying is, and I'm speaking to my own heart as much as anybody else here, but we need to pray, Lord, give me a heart of compassion for lost souls. I don't have it like I should. Help me to see them the way you see them, Lord Jesus, to see them through your eyes, to see them as, as people that are, they're weary. They don't have a shepherd. They, you know, they go through the same things you go through. They go through you know, cancers and they go through strokes and they go through all these things, but they have no shepherd to help them through it all. They're on their own. We go through those things. We have somebody with us. We have a shepherd and bishop of our souls. Now, I want you to see that the early Christians were really committed to this idea of the Great Commission. To them, it wasn't a great omission like it is to many of us. To them, it was the Great Commission. Look at Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. And I want you to see something that is really interesting here. It says, um, speaking of persecution in verse 3, it says, As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house, hailing men and women, committing them to prison. And then it says this, therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. And so 
there's this great persecution, and as a result of it, it, it says that the, the Christians are they're, they're scattered, and they're, they're, the language is this, they're scattered like seed. This is God doing this, really. I mean, God is using persecution, but he's, he's behind it all. They're scattered like seed, and everywhere they go, they preach the word. Now, I want you to notice something in verse uh, 1. Saul was consenting to his death. At that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. And then notice this little phrase, except the apostles. So the only ones that stayed in Jerusalem were the apostles. Everybody else that were scattered abroad, you know who they were? They were ordinary Joe Christians. Right, they weren't. They hadn't had the training, the three years that, that the apostles had had, three and a half years. They hadn't been to the Jesus school, so to speak. They were just ordinary believers, just like you and I, not professional in any way. And 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 as they were scattered everywhere they went, they preached the word. This is not the professionals. This is the ordinary believer. When we came back from Norway, we uh, we got a. A Lyft uh, is kind of like an Uber. Some of you know Lyft. Anyway, we I have an account with Lyft, and we got a Lyft, my wife and I. And the guy who gave us a Lyft, his name was Bob. And uh, he uh, he had bl blasting out of his sound system uh, this hymn about Calvary. And so we just commented, uh, we like your music. And he said, do you want me to sing it to you? So, so he, he was driving down the highway. He's belting out this song full voice. And then, then he, he says to us, he says, do, do you guys know Christ? We said, yeah. <laughs> and he said, well, tell me how to get to heaven. So I, we told him and he said, you know, he said, I have, since I've been doing this job for Lyft, he said, I've had over 3,000 people in my car and only 23 have been able to give me the right answer of how to get to heaven. Isn't that amazing. But I tell you what, that guy, was taking seriously his responsibility to be a witness. And he would, we, we were just pumped. We were so excited. This guy, he was, he was just on fire with the gospel. Just an ordinary guy. But he loved the Lord. And he was scattering the seed. His front seat of the car was full of gospel tracks. <laughs> and even though we were saved, he said, well, you better take one just in case. And you, if you're, you're sure, give it to somebody else. Praise God for Bob. And the bobs of this world. And the only way this world will ever be evangelized if God gives us more bobs. We take it seriously, who are disciplined. They have a disciplined mind about the gospel. And he said, he said, I, I'm, you know, he, he's, I forget what age he was, but he's past retirement age. But what he said was, he said, I, I'm going to go to heaven soon and I want to take as many people with me as I possibly can. Praise God. Do you want to take as many with you as you possibly can? Well, we better get busy. <laughs> Let me say this, that there's not going to be any progress without witnessing and sharing the gospel. Because it, there was a day in America where people came to church. Like it was, it was you know, people send their kids to Sunday school. It was, a, it was the whole culture, really, wasn't it? That culture's gone, folks. It, 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 in Britain, one of the things that we found in, 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 in England was that uh, we ne hardly ever got any visitors who were unsaved coming to meetings. And if we wanted to reach people, you had to go where they were. You had to go into the open air mm -hmm. because it was a post-Christian culture. So Sunday evening, people didn't go to the gospel service. They just didn't do it. So if you're going to see people saved, you've got to somehow. And so our little assembly, we had evangelistic coffee mornings for the ladies. We, we did door-to-door -door work. We did open-air work. We, uh, we, we, we had tent meetings and tried to get neighbors in. We had, uh, we had carols by candlelight services in our homes. We did, like, it's like every activity was centered around how can we reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we weren't seeing people saved. I, I remember when I got baptized, the, the, the hall was so filled that the platform, there were people sat all around the platform. God was working because 
the gospel was going out. And people, you know, if you don't sow, what does scripture say? You don't reap. But if you sow, kind of a law of the harvest, what happens? You reap. And that was the kind of Christianity uh, that we were saved into. Look at Psalm 126. Psalm 126. Book of Psalms, Psalm 126. Just this, this idea, the principle of sowing and reaping as we, we consider this very important topic this morning. And so it, it says in verse 5 and 6, it says, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. God, break my heart over lost sinners. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Look, please, again, at Galatians chapter 6. You want to get this idea of sowing. He that goes forth, bearing precious seed, because the precious seed is the word of God, weeping because of the condition of the lost souls, he will doubtless come again. That's a kind of promise, isn't it? Uh, he will doubtless come again, rejoicing, carrying his sheaves with him. Galatians 6, verse 7 through 9. Notice this. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. He that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not be, notice verse 9, let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season, we shall reap if we faint not. That's a promise, isn't it? Then you, if, if you keep on sowing and you're sowing the good seed of the word of God, the promise is that doubtless, without question, you're going to come again rejoicing. Because if you sow, you reap. I find if I don't sow, I don't reap. I just find that's the way it is. If I don't do door-to-door -door work, I don't get to speak to souls. If I don't do those kind of things. And, and so it's when you do those things, that's when you get to talk to souls. I, I've never been out knocking on doors ever when I haven't had opportunities to speak to a sinner about his soul. And I've had people say to me on the doorstep, they've said um, things like this. We have never heard this before. Thank you for coming to tell us. That's a shock, isn't it? I had a friend, we were in North Carolina having some meetings with a dear friend there. He was, he was in his 70s and he would never, ever knocked on a door. And he heard me speak and he said, take me out. I want to go. So I said, OK, we'll go. So, so we went and the first place we went, it was right near the, the hall. We knocked on this door and a lady was inside and she shouted, please come in. I can't come to the door. And so we both went in and there's a lady. She sat on the couch. Her, her leg is up. And, and she's got a cast on it. And um, turns out she'd had it. She not, normally wasn't there. She was normally at work, but she'd, she'd broken her leg and she, 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 she was just immobile. She was sat there. So we went and told her why we were there. And she said, said you know, she said, it's so interesting. I, years ago, I went to Sunday school. I heard the gospel and I believed it. And I've gotten so far away from the Lord. And I was just thinking about that story about the 99 sheep and the one that went astray. And I was wondering who really cared about my soul. And you came to my door. Oh. So this is the first door this man has ever knocked on. Hmm. He's sold. I mean, he is totally sold. <laughs> one door, next door. Great, up, invited in. People just open to, to listen to what we had to say. And that was the experience the whole day. This guy's blown away. People say door-to-door -door work doesn't really work. People that usually say door-to-door -door work doesn't usually work don't do door-to-door -door -door work. But in, in other words, a lot of things we say don't work, it, it's a, it's a cop-out because we don't do it. And so we, we need to be sowing. Pray for boldness. Uh, you know, it's amazing that uh, we, we talked, it's kind of bringing some of these things together. The word of God is the good seed we sow. We need to know the scriptures effectively. We need to pray, uh, pray for boldness, pray for open doors. Just look, please, at Acts chapter 4 and verses 28 to 31, uh, powerful verses. But the, here are people, and they, they're the same people, by the way, that received the Spirit on the day of Pentecost, 
And um, it, they say in verse 29, and now, Lord, behold their threatenings. They're being threatened, you see, by the authorities not to speak in the name of Jesus. And grant to thy servants, they said, with all boldness that they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. By the way, they were filled on the day of Pentecost and now they're filled again in Acts chapter four. Isn't that interesting? See, we need to be constantly filled with the Holy Spirit. And as they're filled, they're given boldness to speak the word of God. And also pray for open doors. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 3. The apostle, the great apostle Paul, this great missionary, but he says, with all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds. And so it's good to pray, Lord, um, give me boldness and give me an open door. In fact, it's really good to pray about witnessing. My wife and I, we, we often would have opportunities with people and we'd think about great things to say to them after they'd gone. You ever had that experience? At the time, you're kind of all tongue-tied. You can't think of anything to say. And, and then after, after the opportunities passed, all of a sudden you think of all these brilliant things that you could have said. If you've ever had that experience. So I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, you're giving us some great thoughts. Just the timing is off. If you could back it up a bit, we might be able to do more witnessing. And it was amazing. We, we, we've, we found ourselves uh, in opportunities where we just had so many uh, opportunities. And the Lord gave us the right thing to say. As a, as a guy, we, I was getting some equipment from a truck. And um, uh, he, he, the day came to return it. And the guy is chaining on this machine. It was a machine for cleaning the gutters. Uh, you know, kind of like a forklift thing or whatever. Anyway, he's, he's chaining it back onto the truck. And, and, and I said to him, I said, you know, the Bible talks about people who are going to be chained in darkness forever and ever and ever. You ever thought about that? See, the chain was a link. That's no pun intended, but it was, you know, it's, it's kind of finding something. We had another guy came and he had to clean our fireplace. And um, I said, you know, it's all about fire prevention, isn't it? That's what you're doing. You're trying to clean our fireplace so we don't have a fire. A, you know, a, a fire that does damage, not a fire that keeps us warm. And I said, do you ever think about the ultimate fire prevention? Right. And so it's just like the law seemed to give us all these. And it was, it was, I'm not saying anything about us. It's a direct answer to prayer. Lord, we're, we're thinking of these good things, but it's too late. Can you back? And the Lord is faithful. When we're sincere, he will answer those prayers. Lord, give me that ability to, yeah. you talk to a waitress. I, I had a waitress the other day. And, and I said to her, I said, if you could get to heaven, by being a good waitress, you would be a shoe in Because this is down in Texas, and she was amazing. I mean, just an amazing waitress. I said, you'd be a shoe in I said, but you know what? You can't get to heaven by being a good waitress. You need a savior. Just simple things. And so, Lord, help us. We, I'm just saying, a gospel mindset. This is what we need. We really, all of us need it. And if every one of us could, could get exercise this way, we could we could speak to a lot of souls about the Savior. Just even this group, if every one of us had an exercise, think of how many lives we could touch with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so let's think of some practical ways. The power of a gospel tract. I've told this story many times, but it's a wonderful story, and it's true, and I know the people involved. A man had paid to have John 3.16 printed on the back of bus tickets. And there was a, a, a friend, uh, I know him post-conversion, but he was a coal miner, and he was a typical English coal miner. He would, he would uh, get up, come out of the pit, he would go uh, to the pub, he would go have too much to drink, he'd go home, and he would beat his wife up. That was his life. And she stayed with him because in those days you did that kind of thing. And one day he's on the bus and he's looking at this bus ticket. He's going from the mine to the pub and he reads God so loved the world. And he says, could that be true that God could love somebody like me? 
that he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Before he got off that bus, he had passed from death to life. He was a new creature. Instead of going to the pub, he got back on another bus and went home. He wasn't drunk and he didn't beat up his wife. He became a new creature. And he was an elder in one of the assemblies that I knew personally. And his daughter, by the way, was shacked up with a hell's angel. And when she saw the change in her dad, she got saved. Ended up going as a missionary to Brazil. And I could go on and on. The web is, and that person that paid to have John 3.16 on the back, I'm sure he never found out this side of glory. Why was that a good investment? Because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And so use gospel tracts. Uh, when you go to a restaurant, um, again, readiness. You've got tracks at the back there. They're not meant to be at the back there. They're meant to be taken. But I, I love this one for uh, restaurants. Thanks for the great service. May I ask you a question? And it's just a simple gospel track. But what you do is, you know, first of all, you give a generous tip. If you're going to give a mean tip, don't give a gospel track. God is generous. Don't be miserly. It's very unchrist like. And, and then try to have a conversation. Ask the waitress, say, We're going to pray for the food. Do you have anything we can pray for you about? I've only had one person ever re refuse that. It was a God. He said, I don't have anything. I don't want you praying for me. We prayed for him anyway, but he, he didn't want it. But most people are thrilled when you do that. When you go to the, the doctor's surgery, there's all those magazines, stick tracks in every one of them. Like, so just keep sewing. Uh, there was one famous uh, guy in the Jesus movement. And he'd go into restrooms and he would put tracks in the toilet roll. I mean, he just kept keep putting them in there. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, uh, whatever it takes, get it out. Get the message of the gospel out to people. Always make sure that you're armed and loaded when you go out. That's the, being ready, right? Having tracks with you. What is the message they need? We've got a few minutes left. They need to know that God is infinitely holy. Our first task really is to get people lost. To shake their confidence in false religion. To show them that they're sinners. You see, nobody will ever see their need of a savior unless they see who they really are. And so part of the task of evangelism is getting people lost. That's my primary strategy on the doors is to get men lost because unless there's a proper diagnosis, there'll never be a cure. And so we've got to do that. So we've got to show people that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, that every mouth will be stopped and all the world will be made guilty before God. And so there, there must be that conviction before conversion. There must be able to see that they're lost of course the law is good in doing that ten commandments we were talking at uh, supper the other day about um, people who have been saved through the ten commandments just uh, showing them their lostness so i talked about a guy i know in ireland and he uh, heard a sermon on the sabbath somebody was preaching through the ten commandments and keep the sabbath to keep it holy and he just thought i've never even given god 10 minutes never mind the whole day and he was convicted. And as a result of that, heard the gospel and got saved. Isn't that interesting? So, so we can do these things. And then once somebody is persuaded of their lost condition, we then show them that Christ is the only savior of sinners. And he saves sinners by becoming the substitute, by being the one that dies in their place and in their stead. And the fact that he suffered and died like that and then rose again. Don't forget the resurrection. That's so essential to the gospel message. He rose again to show that God accepted the payment that he made on Calvary. That, that, that was the penalty had been paid. And so we need to urge sinners to trust in the Savior. Sometimes we try to get people to come to church and we're putting the cart before the horse. We need to get them to come to Christ. And then tell them about coming to church. Because there's lots of lost people in churches. No, they need to come to Christ. And so another way that you can share the gospel very simply, time is just about gone, but is by using your testimony.
One thing that you have, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus, is you have a testimony. The Apostle Paul, we, we read about the actual event of his conversion in Acts chapter 9. But he repeats it in chapter 22, and he repeats it in chapter 26, and then he alludes to it in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15 and 16. And the idea is this, that every chance that Paul gets, he tells people, listen, let me tell you how I got saved. And there's something wonderful about a testimony, isn't it? It's unique. Nobody can contradict it. This is my story. This is what happened to me. And so write out your personal testimony. If you've never done that. And pray, Lord, give me an opportunity to tell somebody how I got saved. And ask them what they think. Have you ever had an experience like that? These are just simple things. But it's a discipline. It's a disciplined mindset. You will never drift into doing the work of an evangelist. It begins with a, a way of thinking. And we need the Lord to change us. We need the Lord to show us. Lord, you have blessed me so much through the work of your son, the Lord Jesus. I mean, I, I'm on my way to heaven. I mean, just I'm one heartbeat away from an eternity in the presence of the Lord. I deserve the hottest hell. But look at me. I'm saved. And I want to share it with others. I want others to know how they can have the same joy of forgiveness of sins, of new life, of new purpose, of satisfaction. Like, you know, sin is really expensive. You know that? Really costly. When I was unsaved, I had no money because I was spending it all on drink and all these other things, and I was constantly skinned. I had no money. Now, I'm high all the time, and I don't need artificial substance. I've got the joy of the Lord is my strength. And it's yours too. And it, it cost him everything. It costs us nothing. Oh, what a blessing we have. But let's not be mean. I remember when my first born son was born, getting on the phone and calling everybody that I knew to tell him, I got a boy. <laughs> I was pretty excited. Well, I got a ticket to heaven. That exciting? Pay it in full. First class, I'm on my way. Let's share that with others. Let's be disciplined. If there's a future at Boca Raton Bible Chapel, somebody has got to start speaking to others about the Savior. You can't depend on retirees moving to Florida to build your assembly. It's not going to happen. You need something better than that the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we come before thee. We, we again just are so thankful for the examples that have gone before us. Men who are, even people that told us, Lord, how grateful we are that somebody had the boldness to speak to us about our soul's condition. Lord, we were ever in their debt. Uh, Lord, we're, we're so blessed that somebody spoke up and told us that we were sinners and we needed a savior and father we pray that you would give us holy boldness lord forgive us we're not very bold but give us boldness give us supernatural boldness from thyself from the spirit of god to be able to get over our timidness get over our pride of what people will think to us uh, of us and lord just help us to be able to speak to souls Lord, even this week, Lord, if we could just make it a purpose in our minds, Lord, give me opportunity this week to speak to some lost sinner about the Savior. Now give me the glory. In Jesus' name. Amen.